Good morning, my friends, and thank you for joining me for Facebook Live. Uh, my name is John Phipps, and I'm the lead pastor of Park Place Church. And, um, you know, um, my staff did a wonderful job last week leading you in devotions. And I just want to say thank you to uh, Pastor Jonathan and Pastor David and Pastor Peggy. And even Mandy on Saturday night did a uh, Saturday night devotion uh, we call it SNL, Saturday Night Live, on Facebook Live. And so I'm just so grateful. Um, I see your names there. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining me, all the usual friends and suspects. So that that uh, week that I was gone, uh, just so you know, uh, I was in Lakeland. I'm working on a doctorate program that's going to take me three years. And I have to do what's called a residency um, the residency is interesting um, because it means I have to be on campus for a week, <clears throat> three times a year. And um, I really enjoyed it. I'm with people that are very, very bright and sharp, very intelligent. So thank you for, you know, um, um, just praying for me and just being patient with me. Uh, I didn't get my sermon done until Sunday, I'm sorry, Saturday, and then I preached it on Sunday, and uh, we had a wonderful time of worship yesterday. Mandy led us beautifully. So good morning, guys. I see you all back. I've missed you. So I've, if you're just joining me, I thanked all my staff for being with you uh, for our devotions. They love teaching, and this church has good teachers. Amen? They're all different. They bring something different to the table every time, uh, but they do a fantastic job. And then also, I want to say, um, Pastor David led the Wednesday night uh, teaching at 6 p.m. on Facebook Live, and he did tremendous. The funny thing is, and he and I kind of made a joke about it, was those of you that know Pastor David know that he's, he's all preacher, okay? Uh, I've never heard him teach before. He just likes to preach. And so, uh, now, most, let me just kind of preface this by saying most people are either a teacher or a preacher, and it's hard for them to turn it off when they're a preacher and go into teaching mode, but they're very different. Some people, even on Sunday morning, will be more of a teacher than a preacher, and uh, Pastor David is a preacher. I consider him probably the best preacher um, that I've seen and probably uh, the best that we have. But nevertheless, on Wednesday night, he surprised me. He flipped the script on me, didn't he? Because on Wednesday night, he gave a wonderful teaching lesson. So he is naturally a preacher, but on Wednesday night, he did a wonderful job teaching. And that's really great. I think he's learning how to um, get, get himself into a different mode, uh, which is considered a teaching mode. Um, I personally like preaching more than teaching, but when I do my devotions with you um, Monday through Friday at 11 a.m. on Facebook Live, I'm typically teaching. This is me just sharing scriptures and just trying to teach you something new and build off of God's word. Preaching is very different. You're using illustrations. You're sometimes um, much more passionate. You're coming from a, a completely different perspective. Preaching and teaching are not the same thing. Good morning, Mike, and good to see you, Michelle and Pam. Uh, the other thing I just want to say is a lot of times when we get into teaching mode, good morning, Matt, it's important for us to stay on point. So for those of you that are coming on during my teaching, uh, it's nice when I can recognize you and say, hey, thank you for joining us. Good morning. I also want to remind you that it's important that I stay um, in tune with the lesson so as not to disrupt the teaching. So anyway, um, if you joined us yesterday, yesterday was a great service. We had a lot of fun, uh, good attendance, and God is good and faithful. Uh, we're still batting about 55 to 60% of our usual attendance, which is very typical of churches across the country right now. Um, about 60% of medium size and large size churches have returned to in-person services. The others are watching online. Good morning, Chatster. But our church is no exception. So when we have 175 people that are watching us on Sunday morning, um, that's about 60%. Okay, that's about 60%. 
Um, however, the small church, interestingly enough, is actually about 80%, because I think the small churches uh, feel, uh, are, are, are typically feeling more safe in their environment when they're reaching, you know, their 40 or 50 people, 80 people, that might be considered a small church. Uh, we are a medium-sized church, so uh, do not be concerned about how many people are here, are not here presently. Let people come back when they're ready to come back. Anyway, are you ready? Are you ready to get into God's Word? I, I wonder if you have your Bible open. If you do, that's fantastic. I have some scripture verses for you today. We're going to be working through some things. Um, a lot of what I teach and talk about uh, Monday through Friday is uh, based on my devotions and what I feel the Holy Spirit is sharing with me personally. So a lot of the things that I'm teaching you through my devotions is a projection, uh, if you will. Uh, projection is a psychological term usually used if we are projecting onto other people what we are feeling. Um, so what I'm feeling in my spirit, what the Holy Spirit is leading me to really focus in on is evangelism and my lack thereof, okay? So um, listen, only 20% of all people have the gift of evangelism, 20%. 50% of all Christians have the gift of helps. Now, these aren't my numbers, uh, so don't hold me responsible for this. This is just my research. But I don't want you to feel bad if you do not have the gift of evangelism. However, you do have a responsibility to share your faith to as many people as you can when God gives you opportunities. What do we call those God-given opportunities? I'm not going to wait a long time because I know that there's always a delay between my questions and your responses, but sometimes we call these divine appointments. Now, I want you to understand that the Holy Spirit gives us divine appointments to share our faith, and there's times in which we take these divine appointments, whether it be evangelistic or whether it be a, a teaching moment or whether it be... Um, maybe a, a preaching appointment or whatever the case might be where we get to go to someone's church is a divine appointment. Sometimes we get to hear someone's hurt and feel their hurt. And this is what I would consider a divine appointment. God is allowing us to be empathetic, to feel what they're feeling, maybe to counsel them. So some counseling happens through divine appointments. This is when the Holy Spirit puts somebody in your path at such a time and then gives you a heart and even the words to be able to express your love for them or your support for them. And they need that. And they go away feeling strengthened and encouraged. That, my friends, is a divine appointment. But it also happens in the realm of evangelism. So for the next couple days, today and tomorrow, at least, I think, yeah, I think, uh, let's just say this. Today and tomorrow, I'm going to be talking about evangelism because God is speaking to me about it and how I need to be a better evangelism, sharing my faith, not just inviting people to Park Place Church, but to be speaking the name of Jesus. I need to do a better job of that. And if I need to do a better job of that, then I want to teach you to do a better job of that. So again, there's that projecting, okay? Um, let me just share with you what evangelism is. Evangelism is a word that causes great fear among people. People say, well, I'm not an evangelist, or I get very nervous talking about my faith. Don't feel bad. Uh, we all do. It's not easy to step out and to talk about Jesus to maybe a stranger or to uh, an acquaintance or a friend. But my friends, it is a command. The Great Commission tells us to go out and do this. So evangelism, though it can be a big, scary word, it can also be translated witness. Okay, so we are evangelistic and we can witness. Okay, evangelism is about increasing God's renown. If you're taking notes, you might want to write that down. Evangelism is about increasing God's presence, okay? Wherever you are is God's presence. Why? Because he lives in you. He works in you. He loves you. He calls you a son or daughter. But evangelism 
is about increasing God's presence or increasing his fame, okay? Um, yes, God is famous, okay? Um, don't you love that? Say, well, who's famous? I don't know. Uh, Billy Graham was famous. God is famous. Lady Gaga is famous. Madonna is famous. God is famous. So what is evangelism? Evangelism is about increasing God's fame, my friends. It's speaking the word in the name Jesus. Now, if I invite people to church, is that evangelism? Okay, maybe. All right, I invite a lot of people to church. I pass out a lot of business cards, okay? I am doing business when I do that. I do not consider that evangelism. In my opinion, inviting people to church is not necessarily evangelism. You can disagree with me, and I'm fine if you, if you do, but I want to encourage you to go one step further, my friends. I've invited a lot of people to church over the last three years because I think we have the friendliest church in town. We have the sweetest church in town. We have a prayerful church. We have a impactful church. But when I invite them to church, I am witnessing to some degree about the Christian faith. But am I being an evangelist? I would think not, probably not. So evangelism is about increasing God's fame. So let me share a verse with you, Psalm 105, verse 1. Psalm 105, verse 1. Give praise to the Lord. Proclaim his name. There's some people in the hallway, and I unfortunately left my door open today. So let me read this verse to you again. Give praise to the Lord, proclaim his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. That, my friends, is the crux of evangelism. Give praise to the Lord, proclaim his name. It's not talking about Park Place Church. It's not talking about your Christian family. It's not talking about Christian virtues. It's proclaiming the praise of and the name of God, in particularly Jesus. Thank you, Pam. Psalm 105, verse 1. Marty, you're awesome. Thank you, buddy. Marty came to my office to shut my door. Wasn't that kind? Throughout the Old Testament, God sets himself up above all other gods. He creates a nation with the intent that its people will make his name known among the nations and share the great works that he has done. There is no greater testimony than sharing what Jesus has done in your life. These works culminate in the reconciliation of us to the cross and Jesus' resurrection. My friends, I can imagine no greater motivation than to make his name famous. Pastor, everybody knows about Jesus. Pastor, everybody knows we're a Christian nation. Yes, I agree. In this country, people know the name Jesus. Whether it has a positive connotation to it or whether it has a negative connotation to it is completely in the eye of the beholder. But my point is this, my friends. When you say God has changed my life, and he can change yours too. What are you saying? You are saying that God, or Jesus, who you know, you have always known him, if you've been born and raised in this country, can change your life. This is the gospel, this is the good news, my friends, that I once was a sinner, but now I'm saved. I once was lost, but now I'm found. My friends, the greatest thing you can do in your evangelistic work is to say, I used to be this way, but now I am this way. Glory to God, hallelujah. I'm not who I used to be because God has changed my life. Now we look at Proverbs 1130. Miss Pam, would you write that down for us? Proverbs 1130. Let's look it up, my friends. Flip over, Proverbs, I said 11, chapter 11, verse 30. 
<clears throat> this is good stuff. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and the one who is wise saves lives. I'm going to read it to you again, not because you're slow in understanding, but because I think this is so powerful, and I'm going to springboard off this for my second point. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and the one who is wise saves lives. My friends, there's so much talk about police officers, firefighters. I love these people, these men and women, these first responders, even teachers who put themselves in harm's way right now as we are working through this pandemic. I love them. I know police officers save lives. I know firefighters save lives. They are saving physical lives. But I am not talking about physical lives. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and the one who is wise saves lives, my friends. I'm not talking about the physical body. I am talking about the spiritual body this morning. I am talking about Jesus saving us from the wrath, the coming wrath. When this proverb was written, the idea of saving lives had more to do with delivering them from evil paths which lead to death. In light of the gospel story, it takes on a whole new significance. When considered within the context of Christ's work on the cross, the fruit of the righteousness is quite literally a tree of life. And the work that we have of evangelism and being a witness for God is literally life-saving. Do you not understand, my friends, that what we are dealing with is God's work? <clears throat> Do you know that God is asking you to save lives? He's not asking you to be a police officer and wear a badge or to climb a ladder and... and uh, get up into a second floor window and, and pull, a, pull a young child out of a, a, burning, a burning home. That is great work, my friends. Before I felt the call to ministry, I wanted to be a police officer. It's great work. I admire them and I pray for them. But God is calling you to an even greater work. For those that are in law enforcement, know that they can save the body but not the soul. But those of us that are in Christ Jesus are called to be wise and save lives. How do we save lives? By speaking the name of Jesus. Evangelism is about our willingness to go. Let's read another verse here. Uh, Isaiah 6, 8. Pam, if you would write that in there for me. Isaiah is a major prophet. Flip over, if you would, with me, my friends. You'll find Isaiah. I think it's before Ezekiel. It is. It's before Jeremiah. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8. <clears throat> Isaiah is a very big, big book. Isaiah 6, 8. Here we are. Then I heard a voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And Isaiah said, Here I am. Send me. I love that story, guys. Evangelism is about our willingness to go. I know this creates fear and apprehension within you. It does me too. It's very difficult when only 20% have the gift of evangelism, but God calls all of us to be responsible to take these divine appointments that he has set in advance for us, that we would receive that opportunity. And we would tell somebody, not just about our church, which we have a wonderful church, but this is who I used to be and this is who I am now because of the blood of Christ. Now you can word it in a lot of different ways. When I was speaking on Sunday, I shared in my message that I was inviting someone to our church who I felt 
compelled to invite to church and I gave her a card and she looked at the card and she said my name and then she said are you the pastor and I said yes but that's not why I'm sharing this with you and God said tell her tell her the name that is above all names and I said I'm not inviting you because I'm a pastor but because 25 years ago Jesus Christ came into my life and he changed me forever my friends do you have a willingness to go Isaiah said, then I heard a voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, here am I, send me. Are you willing to say that, my friends? Here am I, send me. Whom shall I send? Pam? Shirley? Carrie? Whom shall I send? Esther? Esther? The other Pam, Hillary, just going through your names there. Whom shall I send, my friends? Is God speaking that to you? You see, God never coerces us to serve him. But he continually offers us a choice. The sixth chapter of Isaiah tells us that the prophet is having a vision of the Lord in his throne room. Oh, how I wish I could have seen that. The sobering vision helped propel him to volunteer to share in the Lord's message. We too are motivated in direct proportion to our experience with God. If we struggle to find the inspiration to share the good news, perhaps it's time to pray for a deeper revelation of God's glory and holiness. What are you saying, Pastor? I'm, I, I, I'm, I, I don't know if I can be more clear, my friends. Good morning, David. Let me say it again. We too are motivated in direct proportion to our experience with God. If we struggle to find the inspiration to share the gospel, the good news, perhaps it's time to pray for a deeper revelation of God's glory and holiness. Or if maybe your heart has turned cold, it's because there is some sin that is unrepented for in your life. And therefore, you need to deal with that first. I believe the church is not evangelistic because our hearts are not burning for Jesus. And once our hearts begin to burn for Jesus again, we will be his witnesses. Again, the way he wants us to be his witnesses. I love you guys. It's not easy for me to teach about this because I'm really speaking to myself too. I know the closer I get to Christ, the closer I get to his heart. And the closer I get to his heart, the closer I get to those that are unsaved. Those that are walking in in, 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 in loneliness and in, in desperation, those that are hurting and grieving, those that are lost. Yes, fire from the throne of heaven. If you are enjoying sitting at the feet of Jesus, you are sensing the fire from the throne of heaven, Pam. But the further you fall away and become selfish and do the things of the world that you want to do, the more your heart will grow cold to those that are lost and dying without Jesus. So my friends, I ask you this morning in closing, will you draw close to Jesus? And by drawing close to Jesus, so that you can draw close to those that are not saved, those that are far off, they may be good people, but they are not regenerate. They may be kind people. They may be moral people, but they don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. They may be um, well-honored citizens in their community. They may be good parents. They may be uh, kind and compassionate. They may feed the poor. There's so many scriptures I would love to share with you, and you know the ones I'm thinking of. But I really wanted to speak specifically about evangelism today, not share and pull a lot of different stories, which take up a lot of time, but to give you a proper understanding and definition of what it means to be an evangelist. 
Don't be afraid of it, my friends. Lean into it and speak the truth. Don't just invite them to church hoping that your pastor will give an invitation. I do that, and I speak about this new life in Christ. But there is no greater name under heaven in which we must be saved. Sometimes, if you invite them to church, the Holy Spirit will compel you. Say the name. Speak the name. You cannot unhear the name Jesus. And just say, Jesus changed my life. He can change yours too. Let them walk away. They will forever remember that one person who said Jesus changed their life. He can change mine. And maybe one day they'll come to a place where they'll remember that. For you cannot unhear that to the glory of God. Amen. I see your comments there. Thank you, Ruby, for joining us. The name of Jesus, my friends, is, a num is above every name. It is unlike anything else. As I said on Sunday, you can take Buddha from Buddhism. You can take Muhammad from Islam but you cannot take Jesus from Christianity. Let us pray. Father, thank you for this simple reminder today. It's an extension of what I preached about yesterday. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man shall come to the Father except through me. And that's what you have on my heart today. So I'm just sharing some basic things about what you put on my heart. And I thank you for that, Lord. Help us to be asking for divine appointments. And then help us to be faithful when they come into our lives. We'll know them, for your Holy Spirit will remind us. He will prick our heart and remind us, God, to speak the name of Jesus. And all we have to say is, X amount of years ago, Jesus changed my life, and he can do the same thing for you. It's a wonderful statement. It's a wonderful testimony. People don't need a lot of scripture. They need to know that Jesus loves them. And then they need to know your word. And if they are inquisitive, then let us share that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one can come to the Father except through him. And then John 3, 3, lest a man be born again, he shall not see the kingdom of God. These are wonderful verses. And they're evangelistic. But Father, let our lives be evangelistic. And as St. Francis of Assisi said, at all times preach the gospel. If necessary, use words. God, it's necessary. I'm seeing the signs of the times. I know you're coming back soon for your bride. Let us bring others together with us to your eternal kingdom. We love you and praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a wonderful day, my friends. Thank you for joining me. Jesus has definitely changed my life, says Shirley. Amen. To the glory of God, he has changed all of our lives. So let us go out and be ambassadors and witnesses and evangelists for the glory of God and for his kingdom. Have a wonderful day, my friends. Today's Monday. I'll be with you tomorrow morning. We're going to talk about evangelism part two. Be blessed.